Okay, these are some notes on section uh, 5.1. Make sure you have your books out and make sure you are reading these, the, the whole section uh, from the beginning to the end. Uh, go through all the reading because uh, there's a lot of uh, material in this that uh, we won't have a chance to cover. Uh, but the main idea is what we're talking about here is we've talked about using uh, differentiation to find the uh, slope of a curve, which is and which ends up being, if we're talking about a velocity curve, or if we're talking about a position curve, it actually ends up being the velocity, the instantaneous velocity. In other words, if we have a position function, and we're talking about the position um, with respect to time, uh, the distance traveled with respect to time, if we take the slope, the change in distance over the change of time, uh, that's actually the velocity. Well, now we're going to go the other direction. We're going to talk with about, instead of starting with a position curve, we're going to start talking about a, a velocity curve. Okay? And we're not going to be talking about the slope, but we're going to talk about what happens if we have a velocity. Let's say we have a constant velocity. This is maybe zero. These breaks mean we're, we're just going to look at what happens between seven and nine hours. And let's say we're going at a constant velocity of 75 miles per hour for two hours. How far have we traveled? Well, we traveled. 75 miles in the first hour from 7 to 8, and 75 miles in the second hour from 8 to 9. So we've traveled 150 miles, okay, if we're going at constant velocity. Well, if we look at the, if we look at the velocity curve graph, I should say, velocity graph, and this is my constant uh, velocity, at least from this point. Between 7 and 9, I'm going at a constant velocity of 75 miles per hour. If we look at this, if we looked at the area of this rectangle, that's 75, and uh, this would be the, or this height would be 75, excuse me, and this would position be 7 hours, and this would be 9 hours. If we look at the length of this rectangle, that would be 9 minus 7 is 2, and the height would be the 75, that would be the vertical position of the graph, so that would be actually 75. Well, if we multiplied the base times the height, which would be the area of this rectangle, area is base times height, we would get 2 hours times 75 miles, which hours over hours become 1, so we just have 150 miles. That's the distance traveled. So the way it works out is that if we, if we think about this, if we have a velocity curve, okay, if we have a velocity curve, and we take the area under that curve, if we have a constant velocity, we actually get the distance traveled, okay? So this area ends up giving us the value of the distance traveled, okay? And we'll talk a little bit more about this relative to the velocity later. But right now, this is one good, if you do have a velocity curve, this is one good way to find the distance traveled. Now, this is a pretty nice trivial example because we've got a rectangle, and a rectangle is an easy a geometric figure to find the area of. What if we had a irregular curve, something like this? Excuse me here. Let's just look at this irregular curve here. And we want to find, this is also velocity, so this would be velocity, this would be time. And in, instead of having a constant velocity, our velocity increasing, we are slow down a little bit, then we increase a little bit, we increase a little bit, then you know, maybe slow down a little bit. So, which is more like really what happens, our velocity is varying as we're driving. Sometimes you hit some traffic, and sometimes you don't. So you can speed up a little bit and just have to slow down. So this is what's happening. Would the if we want to find out how far we traveled from this time to this time from A to B hours, uh, would that work out to be the same thing if we found the area to this curve? Well, basically it would be. Again, if we took the area, we'd be multiplying uh, the base times the height of this figure, except we don't have a way of actually getting all these different altitudes. So we don't have a way of finding the area of a irregular curve like this. But what we could do is we could approximate that by using uh, the simplest geometric figure we have, and that's a rectangle. In other words, if we divided this up into a lot of little rectangles, and they show some illustrations of this in the book, over on page 264, you can see a curve, and they've divided it up into little rectangles there. If we, if we could find the area of all these rectangles, it would be a fairly good approximation for the area under this curve. So that's what we're going to be doing.
we'll be dividing um, this interval into subintervals, and then we'll try to find the area of these rectangles and add them up and get an approximation for the area under the curve. Okay, the, the, the problem is that we have several different ways. If, uh, here's an example of a little interval I divided up. This is a curve, and this is a, one of the like little rectangles we're going to use to find the area under this curve, a subinterval, so to speak. But we've got different ways to get the height of this rectangle. Now we can determine what the base of the rectangle is by taking uh, this length and subtract that length. We could calculate that. That's not a problem. But what are we going to use for the height of this rectangle? Well, we can either use the left end point. That's pretty easy to measure because we know what this value is. Or the right end point. We could figure that out. Or we could actually figure out the midpoint and we could use that as a height. So we have three different ways of finding of, of determining a height for this rectangle that we're going to use to approximate the area under this curve. Uh, we can use the left end point. Now, since this curve is concave down, this left end point will be, can be a rectangle, but that's going to be a little less than the area, so this is what we call an under approximation. If I use the right end point, I get a rectangle, but you see the rectangle is more than the curve, so it's kind of an over approximation. And if I look at this midpoint, well, it looks like there's, if we look at this, there's a little bit I'm missing, but then there's a little bit more. In other words, uh, this is a, an overestimate of this, but it's an underestimate here, so they almost balance out. So the midpoint seems to be a pretty good way of, of estimating the area under this curve, or, or getting, a, getting the height, excuse me, uh, determining the height of a rectangle that will estimate the area under this curve. Because I got a little bit, uh, I'm, I'm missing, and I got a little bit extra, you see, so that if we use this rectangle, that's this, this height. Okay, this rec red rectangle. By using the midpoint of my sub-interval, that would be the midpoint right in the middle. If I use that, value the function at that midpoint, uh, that's, that's going to give me a height for this rectangle. And that would be a pretty good approximation for the end of the curve. I got, like I said, I've got a little a less than the area in the curve and a little bit more, so they kind of almost cancel each other out. So this is what we call a midpoint approximation, rectangular approximation. And we'll talk about that shortly. So again, this part of calculus, this branch of cal calculus, which is called actually integral calculus, we'll be, be uh, focusing on for a while. Uh, this is just actually determining the areas under irregular curves and, and ways of doing that. Okay, and, and this first section is just all numerical approximations. There's actually no calculus in this first section. It's just uh, fractions and arithmetic. And remember, calculus means to calculate. And if you read at the top of page uh, 264, uh, it said, would the area of this irregular re region still give the total distance traveled over the time interval? Newton and Leibniz, and actually many others who had considered this question, thought it obviously would, and that that's why they were interested in a calculus for finding areas under curves. Remember, calculus means to calculate. They imagine the time travel being partitioned into many tiny subintervals, each one so small that the velocity over it would essentially be constant. That's very important. Geometrically, this was equivalent to slicing the irregular regions into narrow strips, each of which would be nearly indistinguishable from a narrow rectangles or from narrow rectangles. So that's all we're going to do is we're going to subdivide uh, these areas into uh, many, many of these little small rectangles. The more rectangles we get, the smaller they would be, and the more closely they would approximate the exact area under that curve. So that's what this section is all about. Okay, and we'll look at a couple examples in the next video. Hope that helps.